Hi, good day. Uh, nice to be back on the Crux Investor. I'm John Champaglia, the CEO of Sprout Asset Management. It has been a very interesting year in, um, in the world economies and particularly in commodities and uh, happy to talk about uh, uranium and, and anything else you'd like to cover today. John, good to see you again. Thanks for coming back on. Uh, yeah, we are going to talk about a few things, supply demand as, as usual, and maybe some of uh, some of what you're seeing out there. If you share that with us, but let's start. Let's start with you. Let's start with Spurt Spot Physical Uranium Trust. What's happening? It's getting it's it's getting tight out there. Um, are you going to start buying anytime soon? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the price of uranium has been incredibly resilient this year, and 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 this is something that. We're not surprised by. We've obviously been talking about this for two years, uh, about these very positive uh, supply and demand fundamentals. But what's interesting to us is that you know the uranium price has gone up for six straight weeks, and and you know t typically summertime is very quiet, where most market participants kind of decide as a group to kind of take the month uh, of August off and, and just put a pin in the price, which happened last year. Um, so the price has been incredibly resilient. I think it's it's clearly being driven by a number of things. One, it is not subject to the same kind of recessionary concerns and fears that I think some commodities have been caught in in the last few months as, as the uh, Chinese economy is, is clearly stumbling a little bit after reopening. Um, and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the utilities finally stepping up and buying larger and larger quantities of uranium. And, and this is something that um, I think is a sea change in terms of their psycho uh, psychology. Uh, they obviously became very accustomed for many years to being able to access as much uranium as they wanted to with very favorable contract terms. The new reality is a lot of the material uh, has been sold uh, under existing contracts and, and growing uh, contracts under long-term arrangements. And, you know, couple the, the reality of security of supply from places like Russia or Kazakhstan or Niger, obviously. Uh, and I think everyone is, is, is more concerned about security of supply. And I think that's been very helpful for the price this year, which uh, is up about $10 a pound. So 48 to $58 a pound in the spot market so far year to date. Right. Okay. And obviously, the delta between um, spot price and and, and forward uh, selling price, co contract price, it seems to be increasing uh, as well, um, which, su which suggests that things things are getting super super tight, as, as you say. So life is good with regards to this accretive growth in price. I want to talk about some of the the other things which um, I think are quite important here, like risk management by some of those buyers. And to do that, you're going to need to look out. You're going to step up, head over the parapet, and look out. Africa. We've seen mo the, uh, most of the African heads of states rushing towards St. Petersburg a few weeks ago, sit down with Putin um, and discuss you know, what, the, what the future looks like, discuss relationships. President Xi of China is there in South Africa now, again, establishing relationships, meeting other heads of states as, as well. It's, it, it's getting very geopolitical. People trying to work out who their friends are. And ultimately, where the supply is going to be coming from. Okay, so what what do you, what do you make of this? We, we we we're used to sort of seeing sort of socialist kind of uh, agenda headlines out of coming out of South America, but now we're seeing Africa cozying up to Russia in the context of the Russia Ukraine you know, and and all of that kind of wonderful supply uh, transition dynamic. How do you call that in terms of risk assessment for the West? Yeah, well, I think there's two really interesting dynamics playing out. One is um, somewhat similar to, let's say, the 70s and, and 80s, where we had an arms race. Um, we're not having an arms race, but we're having kind of a mineral, critical minerals and energy race. Uh, and that seems to be what people are jockeying for position around. Uh, at the same time, you're having this incredible resurgence in resource nationalism around the world. And this, you know, this is not uh, this is not new. This this obviously happens, and it typically happens when new bull markets are forming, and governments around the world see the economic opportunity and the revenue opportunity to capitalize on recovering commodity prices, which many emerging market economies are based on, and governments want to ensure they get their fair share of the economic value uh, chain. 
I think some governments obviously feel like they got shortchanged on previous deals uh, where foreign entities and companies and governments may have got the upper hand on them in terms of uh, taking more of the value out of a, out of, out of a particular country. So politicians, whether you're in Africa or Indonesia, are clearly saying, look, we've got these mineral endowments that the West wants because they're important for battery materials, they're important for solar panels, etc. cetera. Um, and we want to ensure that we get a piece, a bigger piece of the pie. Um, we're not just gonna produce these materials and ship them out in concentrated forms to other countries for processing and then obviously uh, moving to end manufacturing. So we're seeing countries essentially implement export bans where they're saying, look, we're not going to, we're not going to do that practice anymore. We need to have in-country processing so that we can create more jobs and get more, uh, more of the, of the economic pie. Uh, it does add some jitters. Um, you know, Chile is obviously a really good case study right now where they've basically said no more lithium permits to, to uh, private companies. This is going to be done on a public-private partnership basis. The government is going to own uh, some percentage of all future lithium deposits uh, being produced. And obviously that's very important because Chile is, is one of the largest, has some, one of the largest reserves of lithium. And so the rules are kind of in flux right now around, you know, what, what, do, what do these partnerships look like? What do the economics look like? Uh, that does create risks that uh, supply will come on later than expected. That obviously can can lead to sh short-term uh, shortages and price spikes, which we've seen in lithium in the last couple of years. And so I think the, the the commodity investing world is becoming a little bit more uncertainty uncertain because some of these rules are changing very quickly. Absolutely, and and I, it's, it's kind of. Um... It's kind of catching, right? So you, you've seen Guineas, you know, they're, they're, uh, they've kind of got um, a sort of junta in charge then, we say, uh, run by uh, Mamadé Dumbuya. Um, and you've got, obviously, Niger, very topical for uranium investors recently with, you know, obviously Global Atomic and, and GovX and a, a small company called Myriad in there as well. It, it, these countries are saying, we want to capture more of the value in the country, as you, as you quite rightly say. Um, but... Do you, do you feel that if that catches on through the, that, that kind of whole Western Africa, that whole Sahil uh, region, and perhaps for, further afield, what's that going to do for pricing? Because it comes back to that risk assessment of what am I prepared to pay today versus what could, will I, could I have to pay further down the line? And will this kind of speed up that whole um, decision-making process for utilities, which you're saying are back in the market, and even some producers are back in the market at the moment, but they're not buying in huge amounts yet. W what do these headlines do? What do these government decisions in, in Africa do in, the, in terms of that whole supply um, to, 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 to the West, or as was being indicated by, I say, the conversations with, with uh, in St. Petersburg and then now with GE in South Africa, maybe it's, it's also going East. So it's scary times, right? Yeah, we, we've, we've, we are clearly in the last year and a bit have seen a number of different commodities bifurcate. Um, uranium, I think, is clearly one of them where um, the price for Canadian ur uranium, we think is clearly different than the price of Kazakh uranium right now. And that reflects a risk discount um, for Kazakh material, just because of the unknown uh, variables that could play out geopolitically, given the country is, is, is sandwiched right between uh, Russia and, and China. And it's very clear that China would very much like to take as much Kazakh uranium as they possibly can get their hands on, given it's right next door and given uh, China's very ambitious nuclear build-out program. Um, so yeah, we do definitely see security of supply becoming uh, a much bigger issue. You know, in the last um, commodity super cycle, it was very de demand-driven. Um, it wasn't so much a supply issue. Now we're seeing a different dynamic. It's, it's, this time, it's, it's more supply-driven at this point in the cycle because uh, we had basically a lost decade of investment and exploration. So now everything has been driven by supply factors. And then the geopolitical uh, considerations obviously make this make the whole thing very complicated and, and more 
difficult to predict how this is going to play out. But we do we do definitely see the price bifurcating. I think the utilities, the nuclear power utilities have finally figured out um, that they are under tremendous pressure to figure out how to secure supply, particularly away from, from Russian sources. Um, in the US, the US House and Senate have a number of bills working through the process that basically ban the import of Russian conversion and enriched uranium. It's a matter of time, not, not if it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time when it will happen. And I think the message has been received loud and clear. In, in Europe, the agency the, the, there, Euratom, has clearly signaled that uh, member states need to wean themselves off of Russian uh, suppliers. And um, you know this isn't going to happen overnight. But I think it's very encouraging that we're starting to see capacity in the West uh, come back online. Obviously, the Converdine conversion facility which is very, very important, uh, finally restarted in June of this year after being closed for, I think, almost six years. That's important because, one, it, wean, it helps the wean-off uh, process, and two, uh, we've seen a lot of demand for uranium at that particular facility as it reopened, and, and that's a good sign because, uh, you know, the days of these under underfed kind of contracts are well behind us. New contracts are going to be done with... with uh, much higher tails assay, which means you need more UF6, which means you need more U308. So we're starting to see that dynamic finally trickle through into the spot market this year. Um, and then in, uh, in New Mexico, Urenco, which is the conversion, uh, excuse me, the enrichment facility has uh, signaled that they are, they are in the process of expanding their capacity. So we're finally starting to get Western capacity on the conversion and enrichment side, uh, finally moving forward after very long periods of you know, relinquishing market share to Russia. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how that will play out. That you like Niger, I think, um, well, in fact, it was Algeria recently, I think, ref refused France permission to fly military aircraft over their airspace into Niger. So perhaps that, that is going to be uh, elongate the process to um, any potential resolution of, of, of export uh, and supply into the market there. And that can only be. I guess good for uranium price broadly if you're an investor, um, but not so good for utilities. Uh, perhaps you know, it may start to be changing their risk assessment um, on a week by week basis. Uh, at, yeah, at the moment. It's, it's a very good point because I mean, if you if you look at the forward supply forecast model that most analysts have, you sit there and you say, okay, this mine's coming online in 2024. This mine 2025, 28, and and you know the market's already tight. So when you start putting question marks on when is, you know, what, what is the new timeline for that 2 million pounds a year that we modeled or three or four or five, it doesn't take much to throw the market out of whack. And I think um, that's always a risk in the Iranian market because the concentration of mines and country and producing countries is so narrow. Uh, we've been saying this for two years. You, this is a market that is very vulnerable to hiccups because it is so uh, concentrated amongst, you know, basically five or six countries, um, most of which are not the most pro-Western. So that adds another wrinkle into into the story. It, it does the knock-on effect. It's like, it's like I guess the high street of a small town uh, getting a getting a car breakdown. It affects all the roads around it. And I think you know the the, the scale here of the uranium market and, and if we need a market, it must not be understated because it, it, it is tiny. The smallest thing can have such a big ripple effect. Um, and, and, and let's let's talk about some of those um, other ripple effects, which is around um, the, the conversation about the role of nuclear. Obviously that's been gathering um, at, at a pace. It's It's been included in all, all sorts of you know, climate change conversations now, which it don't, Perhaps never, it never would have been. Um, so it's, it's very, very positive out there. But how is that being used and utilized in, in North America? I'm going to count Canada and, and the US here as, as, as one entity for the sake of this conversation. Is like, so you talk about you know Conver and um, you know ramping up here. But 
it needs to happen quickly. It, it, and it takes time for these, these things to get invested into by governments. It takes time for these things, things to be designed, to be built, to actually, you know, be able to produce and produce that volume in, into market. So it, it looks like it's kind of, again, scary times ahead when it comes to um, en enriched uranium. But are the, the, the purse strings being loosened? Will there be money for, you know, downstream and um, again what's the effect for um you know uranium potential uranium producers and developers yeah i mean we, we we continue to see some interesting news developments um where i live in in, in ontario canada which uh is often put out as a model uh, with very strong energy policy given you know about 60 percent of our energy comes from nuclear power here um, our local um, power generation company, um, Bruce Power, just announced that they want to add several megawatts um, of new nuclear capacity here in both large and small modular reactor form. Uh, that's great. I mean, these are not decisions and announcements that get made lightly in government, given uh, the incredible inertia. Uh, I think it's a very powerful s statement that countries around the world are making these kinds of investments. The UK obviously has got this great endeavor to, to revitalize nuclear energy there and get electricity production from nuclear from 15 to 25% uh, in the coming years. It's going to be a very expensive and, and uh, difficult challenge, but governments are clearly uh, making these big announcements. And then I look at little small things like uh, the other day, uh, I, I read that Sweden has repealed the ban on uranium mining in its country. And you say to yourself, okay, maybe that doesn't mean anything, but I think it's highly symbolic that governments are actually focused on these little things. Uh, Sweden, uh, uh, and another example, recently said that they are going to move their grid to fossil free energy and fossil free energy includes nuclear energy. And, you know, this was a country obviously that, uh, has nuclear power today, but has not supported it for a very long time. And all of a sudden they're doing a big policy shift. I think when you add all of these little announcements together, they, they, they form a huge collection of, of data points that, that we watch signaling the shift in sentiment and, and, and public support when it shifts in favor of nuclear energy, governments and politicians capitalize on it because it is a polarizing topic. We saw this uh, almost one year to, a year ago to the day on August 24th last year, where the Japanese finally announced they were going to restart a number of reactors and they're continuing that work. So all of these reactors coming online or getting life extensions, we just view it as incremental future demand for uranium that uh, was not previously forecast. So I think as these announcements pile up, utilities, they have kind of a FOMO, you know, fear of missing out around ensuring they've got security supply um, in a world that's becoming more and more precarious. Yeah, we, we think we obviously cover it every week in our in our um, weekly energy show that the fact that all of these government well, a lot of, we're citing three or four different governments each week in terms of their view to opening up to nuclear as a solution for sure. Demand is there for for sure. Uh, but back back to kind of uranium equities, which is kind of what we're all interested in as investors. We want we're here to try and make money by investing in the right companies. We're seeing a lot of M&A out there. We're seeing a lot of new companies being formed. We're seeing some old projects being kicked kicked into life, or at least, you know, attempt, attempts to. Um, it's, it's all kind of shaking up and shaping up out there. But again, how, how should we view our own risk assessment on what will and, and won't work? You know, going and buying up crappy assets um, out there may, may drive the share price, but What's it, what's it going to do for supply and, and when um, will be, I guess, what utility um, utilities are interested in. For us investors, is it just a case of, you know, take advantage while the sun is shining and and um, everything will kind of work out? There was a phrase quoted at me for four years ago, all boats float on a high, high tide. Um, is, is that the case as an investor? Is that the way I just think about it? Yeah, well, obviously, um, in the beginning of the year, a lot of these smaller uh, uh, stocks in the commodity sector and, and including the uranium sector, they obviously got hit really hard with higher interest rates and inflation 
concerns. But at the same time, you know, utilities have also been willing to uh, start negotiations around longer term offtake agreements with some of these, you know, soon to be producers. And I think that's a really healthy sign that that um, utilities are willing to transact and, and support uh, mines that are getting close to production. So I think that's a very healthy sign. The last few months, we've, we've seen much better sentiment am, uh, amongst uranium stocks. Um, clearly, the, 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 the winning company so far this year has been Cameco. Uh, why? Well, it's the largest, the most liquid, but it's also been winning a ton of long-term contract business. Um, the last few months we've seen, you know, we've seen better performance out of some of the, the smaller mid cap companies. Um, the last three months we've, we've seen the mining stocks, uranium miners finally start to outperform the physical commodity. And when we see that, that reflects more of a risk on, or, you know, risk coming back into the market from investors. Um, I think a lot of the transitory money has kind of been washed out. We we've had some kind of weak, uh, as, uh, as some people call them, uh, tourists kind of come and go. So I think the, the, the market is, is clearly positioned right now with, with stronger hands. And we're starting to see some of the, the smaller cap companies perform much better of late. So I think that's a very encouraging sign. Um, and, you know, I think uh, uranium is a very unique story that investors are, are latching onto right now, while other things that we're getting more interest at the beginning of the year, like lithium and copper, have kind of faded somewhat, uh, largely on the back of China, the Chinese economy uh, being very uh, mixed in terms of its its uh, reopening and growth. And part of it, just lift, the lithium price was obviously at astronomical levels and has, has since corrected. And, and that's taken a little bit of shine off of that particular sector. But uranium is the one that's, uh, it's kind of decoupled and, uh, it's one of the few commodities that that is up for the year. So I think it's uh, it's it's got very unique fundamentals that you know, and it, right now it feels like it's very decoupled from from other commodities as well as uh, some of the broader markets. X, you know, the, the the very small number of stocks that have been been pushing up the, the bellwether indexes. Yeah, I mean, I think I think with commodities and certainly some of the battery battery commodities the past few years, that there have been moments where it's kind of shot out of the gate, and, and, and like most recently with lithium, um, done exceptionally well, but it kind of obviously reverts the mean eventually. Um, so perhaps there's nothing new here if we, if we look back at commodity prices over the years, but it, that's that's the markets for you. They they kind of help you make a lot of money and they kind of revert back some sort of sense and sensibility at some point, which, which is good news. But in terms of this kind of carrying this theme of risk, and clearly you've made a big bet with Sput on uranium thesis. Um, but in, in part, as part of that evaluation, continued evaluation of the market, you must have a section in there which is about risk assessment. So what, in your opinion, is the biggest threat to whether you want to call it the energy transition and nuclear's role in that or, or uranium, however you look at it. Yeah, well, I think I think with uranium, the, the, the number one threat or risk to the sector as a whole is obviously having a, a, a large scale accident, which would shift public sentiment and slow down the transition. The reality, though, is that we need so much more electricity production, not just in developed markets, but in developing markets that clearly want to enjoy much higher uh, standards of living like we do. Um, and if everyone is still focused on decarbonization uh, of their economies and their grids, the, the reality is that we're not getting there on the back of solar and wind. Uh, and I think more and more people are acknowledging that because uh, there is a natural point where you build too much solar or wind on your grid and it just becomes inherently unstable um, or, or, uneconomic, which we're seeing uh, at certain parts of the day in places like California, which literally where power is literally free because there's too much energy produced from solar at certain times of the day. And this all comes back to a key part of the thesis, which is reliable baseload power. And you know, governments uh, have been clearly coached and counseled 
that these decarbonization goals they have will not be achieved without reliable base load power. And that's where nuclear energy comes in. And I think that's what's supporting so many of these new announcements around investments and, and different financial and regulatory support uh, that we're seeing. I think, and you know, obviously with individual companies, um, many of these companies are earlier stage. They can get into trouble, whether it's uh, you know related to permits or geology or, or government actions. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I think ETFs have been popular choices for many investors, because it just allows them to buy a broad cross section of companies to play the thematic. Um, and our, I guess we have three uranium mining ETFs around the world, two in the US, uh, one in Europe. Uh, they've continued to grow this year, even though the sector and the, and the macro headwinds uh, for the broader economy have been, have, have been, been difficult. So we continue to see investors put money into these uranium mining ETFs um, as a way to get exposure, but to, to mitigate some of the individual company risks. And so, and so you think there will be other players coming along um, as the market evolves, as th this tiny little market of ours um, captures the imagination, but also perhaps starts driving some, some value. Um, and if so, where do you think that's going to come from? And, 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 and in the context of bifurcated markets, they're going to have to they're going to have to play on one side of the field or, or the other uh, potentially. Do you think? Yeah, well, we're seeing the market respond with more offerings. I mean, a year and a bit ago, I mean, there were no uranium mining ETFs in Europe. Um, we now have two. There are funds uh, now in Australia. Um, Sprott launched the world's first junior uranium mining ETF uh, at the beginning of this year. So, I mean, th these are important. Um, because investors need options to play the thematic. Um, and I think that's, that's important when you, when you see these product offerings pop up around the world. Uh, it's important because people identify the theme. No one is going to launch a new product if they think it's a six month fad. They're looking at the longer term fundamentals um, and they're saying, hey, this is a very interesting thematic that investors are starting to get interested in. And let's face it, you know, we went through a 10 year bear market where two and a half years into a, what we believe is a new bull market. Uh, these bull markets historically will last several years. Uh, and as a result, we think we still have a lot of runway to go. So it's going to be volatile as, as hell. Um, so you don't want to get washed out. But, you know, if you're well diversified and, and, uh, and you're realistic about, about uh, the expectations and the returns, um, we still think there's, there's a lot of money to be made here.